welcome our friends here that are studying with us this morning in our class here at Sacramento Central. Also want to welcome our friends who are studying through the extended class. Want to wish you a um, happy new year as well. Uh, this, of course, is you're probably watching this if it's recorded three weeks into the year. This is actually happening the 2nd of January as we're recording this now. And so I want to wish everybody happy new year. We have a good study that's dealing with our subject today. We're going through the fruits of the Spirit. Today we're going to talk about peace. But before we get to that lesson, we always have a free offer. And the offer today relates to peace. It's a book by yours truly called Broken Chains. It's the story of that demoniac that was liberated from his possession. And the subtitle for the book is uh, Finding Peace for the Raging Soul. If you'd like a free copy of that, call the toll-free number. It's 866 7883966. I like to say it because some are listening on the radio and they can't see the number on the screen. 866, that's study more. And the book is Broken Chains, offer number 709. We'll send it to you for asking, sort of a New Year's gift. Also, uh, oh, there was something else. I can't remember what it was. Maybe it'll come back to me again. Well, let's get into our lesson while I think about that. I won't let it bother me if you don't let it bother you, but I thought there was something else I was going to say. Anyway, our lesson today is lesson number four. The fruit of the Spirit is peace. Now, we're going through the fruits of the Spirit that are identified there in Galatians. And we have a memory verse. Memory verse is from John 14, verse 27. This is from the New King James Version. You can read it right out of your lesson with me. Those here at Central, I appreciate if you read it out. Here we go. John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Peace. Everybody wants peace. The Bible says uh, an awful lot about peace. You find the word peace uh, several hundred times in the uh, Bible, 429 times in the Bible it speaks of peace. And uh, in the Hebrew, the word for peace, I bet most of you know what it is. Shalom. Shalom. It's kind of like the word aloha in Hawaiian, where they could use shalom for a hello. You can use shalom for a goodbye. And uh, it could just uh, uh, mean favor. It's a way to greet or salute. It means safety, well, happy, friendly, healthy, prosperity. Uh, and that was just sort of the general term. The city of God, Jerusalem is what we call it, but it's really Jerusalem. It's the city of peace. Now, the city of peace here in the world today, not much of a city of peace. Matter of fact, right now they're talking about, they've got, you know, Jerusalem is divided since they had that six-day war. And they're talking about taking the capital for the new Palestinian state and having it on half of the city of Jerusalem. And of course, it's a holy site for the Jews on the other half. And you've got that, that incredible tension between Israel and the Palestinians and all centered in this city of peace. So it's sort of a paradox when you really think about it. When we think of Jerusalem, we think more of the new Jerusalem where there really will be a city of peace. You don't have that in this world. Now that's the Hebrew word for peace, shalom. In uh, Greek, the word is uh, Irene. And by the way, that's where any of you have the name Irene. That's where you get the word Irene. It's from that uh, Greek word for peace. And it means peace, prosperity, quietness, rest, to set it one again. Now, when we're studying the subject of peace, it is a very broad uh, subject, very broad topic. And so... Uh, I probably ought to start out by explaining that in the same way you would say God is love, you can safely say God is peace. It defines the essence of who he is. Uh, think about what the absence of peace is. Picture a person that's nervous, worried, wringing their hands, apprehensive. Is God ever any of those things? Do you ever see God fretting? Why do people fret? Because we don't know the future. Maybe we're worried about the political situation and can't control it. Or we're worried about the, um, our health. How much longer will we live? 
We're worried about what people think of us. You think about all the things in the world that would take away a person's peace. Do any of those things affect God? So God is not affected by that. You can't steal his peace. Even though God, he may be hurt by things that happen. Can be, God be grieved? Can a Christian have peace even though their body is hurt? Can a Christian have peace even though they're sorry about what someone is doing? There's an inner peace that goes beyond circumstances. You know, a story I like to use in the Bible to illustrate this. The disciples are crossing the sea with Jesus. They get into this supernatural storm. I've got a theory that the devil wanted to swallow up Christ while he was so vulnerable out in the middle of this, this ocean, deep water. The devil wanted to drown him. And so this uh, just diabolical storm and great waves came up and the water was swamping the boat. And the disciples are in the boat with Jesus. Most of them are fishermen. They were scared for their lives. They were terrified of the storm, exceedingly af afraid. Well, Jesus gets up and what does he do? He surveys, they wake him up, you know, lightning flashes. They forgot that Jesus was in the boat with them and you think that would have made them feel better. So they wake him up and say, Lord, don't you care? We're perishing. Wake up, do something. So the Lord gets up, he looks around, and he says one word. Now we read it in Greek. He didn't probably say it in Greek. He said it in Hebrew. Jesus simply looks at the raging elements and he says, Shalom, peace, be still. All of a sudden, the waves flatten out the wind just comes to a screeching halt and it says in the Bible there was a great calm. Just all to go from this storm to calm, you've never seen anything like that. Maybe you've seen some storms before where it's blowing and you look out and all of a sudden the sun's shining, it's calm. It doesn't happen that often, but they lo looked at Jesus now and you know what it said? Now they were exceeding afraid. The storm is gone. Their circumstances have changed and they're still scared. Now they're more scared about who's in the boat with them. They're thinking, what manner of man is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? They thought their problem was the storm. God took away the storm and they're still scared. So their peace was not affected by circumstances or environment. Their lack of peace was something on the inside. It was an apprehension about not knowing you ever heard someone say, we're scared of what we don't know? It's uh, people are scared of the dark. Maybe you were as, maybe you still are, I was going to say as a child. But it takes away our peace because we don't know. We feel powerless. Well, God is never in that situation. God knows all things. He's not affected by circumstances. Did Jesus still have peace in his life when he was being gossiped about? Can you have peace when others are saying bad things about you? Did Jesus still have peace in his life when he had to sleep out on the ground, didn't have a nice hotel room? You remember Paul said, I've learned in whatever state I'm in to be content. So the peace that God offers is a peace that passes understanding is not influenced by these circumstances. Why don't we look up some verses here? I think I gave out a few. 2 Thessalonians 3.16 now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. The Lord be with you all. Here he's called the Lord of peace. He is the Lord of peace. And if you just do a little bit of counting in the Bible, when it speaks about Jesus, Jesus is often identified, I think seven times in the New Testament, as the God of peace, the King of peace, the Lord of peace. And so one of the titles of Jesus is the prince of peace. So it's the very essence of who his character is, which begs this next important question. And let's take the, uh, the next microphone over to uh, Jeff there. Can you have peace without God? I'm not going to answer that yet. Go ahead and read for us Psalm 119, verse 165. Psalms 119, 165. Great peace have those who love your law, and nothing causes them to stumble. Can people who hate God's law or are disobedient have great peace? Well, is there a counterfeit peace? Does the devil have a counterfeit for every truth of God? Does the devil have counterfeit love? Is there a counterfeit for the 
Sabbath? Is there a counterfeit for the Holy Spirit? Counterfeit baptisms? I mean, just about every truth of God, it would stand to reason the devil has probably manufactured some counterfeit peace. Let me read something to you here from uh, Thomas Watson, a famous preacher, Christian writer. Listen. Peace flows from sanctification, but they being unregenerate have nothing to do with peace. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. He's quoting Isaiah 57, 21. They may have a truce, but no peace. God may forbear the wicked for a while and stop the roaring of his cannon, but though there be a truce, there is no peace. The wicked may have something which looks like peace, but it is not. They may be fearless and stupid, but there's a great difference between being stupefied and having a stupefied conscience and a pacified conscience and peace. When a strong man armed keeps his palace, his goods are at peace, but he may not have peace. Luke 11, 21. This is the devil's peace. He rocks men in the cradle of security. He cries, peace, peace, when men are on the precipice of hell. These seemingly, uh, the seemingly peace a sinner has is not from the knowledge of his happiness, but the ignorance of his danger. Ooh. So there are a lot of people that have a counterfeit peace. When the Lord comes again, will many come to him, many, and say, Lord, Lord, anticipating eternal life? They thought they were saved. And what does he say? I don't know you. Well, they had great assurance and peace that they were saved. But he says, you're not. So they were anesthetized with counterfeit peace. That's a scary thought. Makes you, if you're smart, reflect a little bit and think, I feel peace. Is it real? Great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing will offend them. So one thing is, are you obedient? If you're living in willing disobedience, and you've got peace, well, that's pretty scary. That can just mean that you have numbed your conscience. You need to pray that that Novocaine wears off, and you start to feel conviction again. So you want it to be a genuine peace. Isaiah 57, 21, there is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. Again, Ezekiel 13, because indeed they have seduced my people saying peace when there is no peace. So are there some out there preaching a counterfeit peace? That's one of the first things we've got to establish, friends, is that we need to know what the authentic peace is and where it comes from. It's very dangerous, you know. The Bible talks about a person that's inebriated that sleeps on top of a mast. How can you do that? Peter was sleeping on death row. And there's a lot of people in the world today that are sleeping on death row and they don't know. Have you met people that say they don't believe in God and they seem tranquil? There's a psalm. This just came to me. It's not my notes. Go to Psalm 37. Psalm 37. It talks a little bit about some... Let me read this here. Do not fret yourself because of evildoers, verse 1 nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they'll be soon cut down like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land. Feed on His faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and He'll give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in Him, and He'll bring it to pass. He'll bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Now, if we look around and we see those who are wicked, they're prospering, they seem to be successful in their schemes, and we think, how come they seem to be at ease? Job talks about this. The wicked who seem to be flourishing, they seem to be at ease. Their stocks are going up. Their health is robust. And, and they sleep well at night, and you're going... This doesn't seem fair. You know, this is the big question in the book of Job. Why do bad things happen to good people and why do some bad people have good things happen to them? And so there's a counterfeit peace out there in the world. Can a person have some peace financially? All their bills are paid. Investments are going well. They got the pantry full and no immediate concerns. They've got all the toys that they want. Their health is good. They might have financial peace. Um, and some people are content to have physical peace. My grandfather used to say, if you're healthy, you're wealthy. 
If you're healthy, you're a rich man. If you got your health. And some people, teenagers, you know, they're just, in, they've got a lot more energy than they have time to, to utilize. And they just, they almost feel immortal. And there's a certain um, counterfeit piece that comes from being in vibrant health. It doesn't mean you have eternal life, but they got a whole lot of this life. And then you've got some people who have a false sense of peace because they're drugged. I think we're living in the most drugged generation in the history of the world. A lot of people out there, and I'm not just talking about folks who might be taking medical, some medicine for a chemical imbalance. Um, some people, I think, are depressed because they're living outside of God's will, and so the doctor prescribes something to compensate for the unrest in their heart, and they feel this false, placid satisfaction and ease because before they had these panic attacks because they knew they were going against the will of God, and now they've numbed it with medication. Now, I'm not telling you to get off your medication. I'm not a doctor, but I'm just telling you, isn't it true? Some people do it with alcohol or other drugs. They medicate themselves to get a false sense of peace. And so a lot of counterfeit peace out there. The peace that God is offering is not changed by what might be happening to our health. When Jesus was uh, being tortured, he still bore himself with peace and dignity. So we're looking for that real peace that passes understanding. Someone said once, it's madness for sheep to talk of peace with a wolf. And so if you're talking to the, if you're in relationship with the devil and talking about peace. And again, John Bunyan said, if we have not quiet in our minds, outward comfort will do us no more than a golden slipper on a gouty foot. Any of you know what gout is? We don't hear much about that these days, but uh, putting a golden slipper on a gouty foot, that's well put. Only John Bunyan could come up with something like that. For people who are living sinful lives to talk of peace. Uh, the solution, of course, is Jesus said, you want peace? This is part one. Um, Matthew eleven twenty nine and 30, Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest, peace for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So here's step one. If you want that peace that passes understanding, you need to yoke up with Jesus. You need to connect your life with him and be willing to follow him. Martin Luther said, true peace is not merely the absence of some negative force. It is the presence of a positive force. So it's not just taking away the storm on the outside. It's the Prince of Peace on the inside. All right, read for us, please, Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Philippians 4, 6, 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything be prayer and petition with thanksgiving. In everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all the understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Thank you. You know that one part that I especially like in that verse, the peace of God that passes or transcends all understanding. You know what that means? You can't explain it. How can you explain a person that has peace when they're about to die? Are they about to lose everything that they've got in this world and they have peace about it? How do you explain that? I mean, how do you explain Job? saying the Lord gives and the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord, when he's just lost his family and, and all his possessions. Um, the person that's got that kind of peace, uh, it passes understanding. It transcends understanding. How do we get that? It says through prayer, by prayer and supplication, by having an ongoing relationship with the Lord and Jesus staying alive inside, we have that. A lot of the letters in the Bible, you find this in Romans 15, verse 33, end with a benediction of peace. Now the God of peace be with you all. There he is again being identified as the God of peace. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. You know, peace is something that seems like we're born with. You ever heard someone say he's sleeping as peaceful as a baby? Of course, some of your babies weren't very peaceful, I know. But they must have had their moments. 
And then it seems like we lose that in degrees. After people lose their innocence, they often lose their peace. The peace of God be with you all. God is offering to that. Finding peace part two. John chapter 14 verse 27. I think we all know this verse. Jesus said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You ever heard a person calm down because they're being told to calm down? Someone's anxious and fretful and you say, don't let your heart be troubled. How does that help? That work? Can you scold a person into peace? How can we apply the words of Jesus where he said, let not your heart be troubled? How does that become real for us? Because his words are different than our words. I can say, let there be light, nothing happens. When God says, let there be light, it can illuminate a planet. And so the very fact that Jesus says, let your hearts not be troubled, he, <clears throat> pardon me, he's speaking peace. When you read that and believe it, it can become a reality to your soul. You ever read the promises of God and just in reading them, you find peace? You know, and that's right there one of the big keys, not only in prayer, but in reading the promises of God, that brings this peace that passes understanding into our lives. Peace I leave with you. Now Jesus ascended to heaven. How is it that he left peace with us? What did he send? He sent the Holy Spirit. Does the Holy Spirit bring peace into people's lives? When Jesus was baptized and the heavens parted, how did the Spirit come down? In the form of what? A dove. What does a dove represent? You know, I heard about uh, a little girl in, on the coast of Finland. They have these enormous sea eagles and one swooped down and picked her up. She was small enough and it flew and uh, there were witnesses and it tried to take her up to its perch on a cliff and it dropped her on a ledge. She was ultimately rescued. I got an amazing fact about this and uh, looked into it. I've also heard about people attacked by other raptors like owls. Anyone here ever been attacked by a dove? In your nightmares at night, does suddenly a dove appear to scare you? If a raven shows up on your windowsill, you might think it's a bad omen. Last night uh, we were talking to Steve and he was saying, you know, I like the name Raven for a son. I said, you got to be kidding. I said, I can think Edgar Allan Poe had a, a doleful, macabre poem about the raven. I said, I don't know, the raven. Raven, I mean, if you're Elijah and you're fed by ravens, that's one thing. But doves in the Bible, they were gentle. They were sacrificed like Jesus. It's a symbol for peace. You know, a dove's interesting. You can put a lot of birds down a chimney and they can't get out because they need a, run, they need a uh, landing strip to take off, a runway. A dove can fly straight up. You've probably seen them do it before when they release them. Just whoop, dove can fly straight up. Doves are like peace. The Holy Spirit came into Christ as a dove. So what does the Holy Spirit bring into our life when, when we're baptized and we accept him? Peace. Why do we get peace? What else was said to Jesus when he was baptized? This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Doesn't it give you peace to know that you've got the approbation of your heavenly Father? That ought to bring you peace to know that God is pleased with you. And if for any reason God is displeased with where you are, you should not have peace. So peace comes from knowing that you are accepted by God. When your sins are forgiven, when you're baptized, you come up out of the water, your sins are washed away, the Holy Spirit comes down like a dove, the voice of the Father is speaking to you. You're hearing God's guidance. That, in turn, brings peace. All right, let me see here. Do we get peace from uh, politics? Do politicians promise peace? 
in the last days, are they going to say peace, peace, when really we're on the verge of sudden destruction? So it's not from those kind of external things. Herbert Hoover said, peace is not made at the council tables or by treaties, but in the hearts of men. You see a lot of people give the peace sign. We used to have, so that was called the victory sign. Others had the peace sign. And then, then they got that peace sign that they put on T-shirts. And, and uh, there are a lot of stories about that. Some said that was actually the cross of Jesus. It was a diabolical sign, the cross of Jesus upside down and broken. And you look at it, and uh, others during the Vietnam War, the veterans said it was the footprint of the American chicken. Because if you ever saw that peace sign, it did kind of look like a chicken's footprint. And uh, so a lot of talk about the peace sign, where this peace comes from. Interesting, since the 1918, for every year of war, and that's when they signed the Armistice Treaty after World War I, 1918, for every year of war, there have been two minutes of peace. We all know about the Peace Prize. Nobel Peace Prize, very famous, famous prize. Do you know the story of how that developed? It was, of course, uh, Alfred Nobel that set aside the funds from his business and uh, his estate for this prestigious award. Most people don't know the amazing fact behind that. What is Alfred Nobel famous for inventing? Dynamite, an explosive. Now, he developed the explosive because he thought it would be very helpful in mining, in construction, in building. But the military leaders quickly realized the great potential of TNT in war. And they used it that way. And um, Alfred Nobel had several brothers. One of his brothers died actually in the development. They were doing experiments on a barge out in the water because it was so dangerous. And one of his brothers died uh, in an experiment, uh, an explosion that took place. He had another brother that uh, lived a natural life but died just before him. And horror of horrors, when his brother died, they mixed up the names and the newspaper printed the eulogy of Alfred. They thought that Alfred had died. They got the wrong information. And they had him, they called him the Lord of Dynamite, and they talked about all the carnage and destruction that came into the world because of his discovery. Well, that broke his heart because he was a pacifist. And partly because of that, maybe he wanted to change his legacy. He said, look, I don't want to be remembered as the king of dynamite and be, have my name and my life connected with all this death and destruction because of dynamite. And so he set up the peace prize. So now when people think of the Nobel, the name Nobel, what do they think of? Do they think of dynamite or do they think of peace? Well, they thought of peace until I told everybody this. But uh, a lot of misunderstandings. Another little amazing fact for you. A few years ago when the Soviets signed the treaty with uh, Britain and the U.S. to disarm hundreds of their missiles, they shipped a lot of the steel, not the actual radioactive material, but the steel that cased the missiles to Britain. Britain then converted it to casings for pens, ballpoint pens, and they made 100 million pens from this. And I guess that puts a new twist on the verse in Isaiah that says, that will beat our swords into plowshares. Also, puts a new twist on the phrase that the pen is mightier than the sword, huh? Thought that was interesting. Can a person have peace in their heart if they don't have peace in their home? That's our next section, Hebrews 12, 14. Someone read for me Hebrews 12, 14. Do you have that verse? Let's get your microphone. Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. One of the most powerful ways that we can witness to the world as Christians is to model peace in our lives. Have you ever heard of somebody else that became a Christian because they knew a Christian that had this uncanny peace in uh, dire circumstances? You know why the Christian church exploded during the persecution of the first two centuries? Because the Christians were out there in the Colosseum and when they would release the lions and wild beasts on them to tear them apart or they were being torn apart by horses or whatever or being burnt to death for their, their faith, they had this unnatural peace. 
And so the pagans would say, you know, I live in constant fear. I'm just always panicked about eternity and, and the gods and what they're going to do to me and Hades. And, and the Christians have such peace. I need to know more about this religion because everyone's dying. If you can die with peace, that's what I want. And so they witnessed through their peace. Not only is that true in an individual's life, but what about in their home, in your neighborhood? Sometimes you can hear people yelling and the pots and pans flying in the neighbor's house and you can't always write it off and just say it's because they're Italian. Uh, sometimes it's because they don't know Jesus. And there's a lot of strife. You know what the number one call is the police get? Domestic problems. It's often connected with alcohol, but not always. A lot of friendly fire takes place in the homes and I wish I could say that it doesn't happen in Christian homes. It's very sad as a pastor, even in Christian homes, sometimes, I mean, it's fine if you have discussions and disagreements. As a matter of fact, it's healthy that you do in your homes. It's part of communication. But when they become wild and violent and there's this constant tension and there's no peace in the home, do the neighbors know about that? They'll end up knowing about that. You can't hide that forever. But if they notice that the family seems to have tranquility and peace and that there's love in the home, and if you invite people into your home and they study the Bible, you know it's one thing if you can fool the neighbors once you walk out the door. But when you invite them into the home, you know there's an energy that people exude. There's an atmosphere. There's an aura that's in the home. And when people come into the home and there's peace in the family, peace in the home, people sense that. They say, what do you guys have? How can we never have what you have in your home? It's a tremendous witness. God wants us to have that. Romans chapter 12, this is very much like Hebrews 12. Romans 12, 18, we gave that to somebody. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Why does Paul work it that way? If possible. Well, let's face it. There are some people that are so cantankerous that it's impossible. You remember when uh, it speaks about Joseph's brothers. No matter how nice Joseph was, it says, they were so consumed with jealousy, they could not speak peaceably unto him. They couldn't say anything to Joseph without meanness and sarcasm just because it was boiling over in their hearts. And so all you can do is what you can do. You can have peace even if others around you don't want to have that in the relationship. As far as possible, live peaceably with all men. And if it means you've got to go the second mile, if it means that your neighbor might take advantage of you, sometimes in the interest of being a peacemaker, you let them, you turn the other cheek, right? As far as possible, live peaceably with all men. I remember hearing this story about uh, this man in India, and there was so much turmoil in his family, he just couldn't stand it anymore. His wife and two or three kids and just strife and bickering and he went to this wise guru in the village that everybody greatly respected. He said, what can I do that I can have peace in my family? He said, just there's no peace in our home. He said, you need to let the rooster move in to the family with you. He didn't question the wise man. You never questioned him. So he took the rooster and he put it in the family. And a week later, he came back to the guru. He said, things are worse than ever. All wee hours in the morning, he's crowing and his feathers everywhere and clucking around. He said, it's just awful. He said, you must trust me. He says, now you must take the goat and bring the goat into your house. And so he didn't question. He brought the goat into his house. A week later, he came back and he said, these things are impossible. He said, you get the goat, you got the rooster. He says, the noise, the smell. He said, I can't explain to you how terrible things are right now. He said, now, he says, take out the goat and the rooster and let me know how things are going. Came back a week later, he says, boy, it's sure been quiet. <laughs> <laughs> One reason that we don't have peace in our families is because we don't appreciate what we do have. And compared to the way it could be, uh, sometimes uh, things could be much worse than they are. Uh, it, it's perspective. And if we're thankful for what we do have, and if we're thankful for who we do have, some people think, I can't live another day with this cantankerous husband of mine. Well, try living with a goat for a week, and you'll find out he's not so bad. <laughs> Every now and then, Karen will get off the phone, and uh, she'll be talking to someone, one of her old friends from school, who will be sharing the horror story of what's happening in their family. 
And Karen will say, Doug, after hearing all of that, she said, I really like you a lot better. <laughs> So it's just, it's a matter of perspective. <laughs> so God wants us to have a complex in our family. You know what a complex is? A complex. He wants there to be more calm in our families. Not only should we pray that God will give us peace in our families, and that's one way to witness, but, um, oh, uh, by the way, Martin Luther, before I leave the subject of family, there's a good quote here. Martin Luther said, to have peace and love in a marriage is a gift that is next to the knowledge of the gospel. You know, I think one of the first places that we learn peace is in a marriage because here you've got two people that are really different creatures, men and women. And when they have to learn, if you, you got to learn it, everybody, to live together in harmony where there's going to just naturally, inherently be different needs and expectations be it by virtue of your being men and women. That's part of our learning love and having peace uh, in the world and every other way. The gospel is best demonstrated in the family. It starts with mom and dad, husband and wife. What about peace in the church? The church peace is almost always going to be an extension of first you got individual peace with Christ, that will play itself out in family peace, that will play itself out in church peace, that will then end up influencing national and political change. I resent when the government says we're going to teach you, to, we're going to compel and legislate peace and love and kindness. It really must start with the individual and be in the family and be in the church and then it overflows into the community and the government. It cannot come from the government down. If there's not peace in individuals and in families and in churches, you're never going to have it in communities. And by the way, without God, I don't believe you can have that peace. Because without the Prince of Peace, you're not going to have peace. Peace in the church. Someone look up for me Isaiah 26 verse 3. You got that one, Stephen? Bring the microphone here. Isaiah chapter 26 verse 3. While they're setting up for that, I'll read Matthew 5, 23 and 24. These are the verses that go along with the, the section for uh, that day. Therefore, if any of you bring your gift to the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar. Go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. So God's telling us in the church, Jesus said, all men will know that you are you're, you're my disciples by your love for one another. And if the world sees that there's strife and, and bickering in the church and that we can't get along with each other, and that's why Paul said, what a terrible witness it is when Christians sue Christians and they can't mediate those things as brothers and if not, at least before a body in the church, but they've got to go to unbelievers in the world to fight out their um, covetousness. Uh, that's a sad tragedy when that happens. All right, go ahead, Stephen. Read for us um, Isaiah 26, verse 3. Isaiah 26, 3 from Revised Standard Bible. Thou dost keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusts in thee. Keep him in perfect peace. How many of you would like to have that perfect peace? How do you get that? It says because his mind is stayed on thee. What does it mean to have your mind stayed on something? Just like it sounds. It means it's fixed on something. If our minds are fixed on God, and if Jesus is the Prince of Peace, what's the result going to be? We're going to have that peace in our hearts. Talking again about uh, the peace in the church, Colossians chapter 3, verse 13 to 15. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another if any man has a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let, your, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you are called in one body, and be thankful. So if we're going to live in the city of peace, shouldn't the church on earth be a miniature or a preview of that city of peace? What makes the New Jerusalem a city of peace? No, wait, let me ask that question differently. 
Do most cities have peace? When people think about I'm going to move somewhere peaceful, do they say a city or do they say the country? Why do they say the country instead of the city when they're looking for peace? Because most people do not have peace and cities are concentrations of people in turmoil. And so cities are often concentrations of crime and violence and greed. And so cities are very rarely places of peace because you get people that don't have peace concentrated. The church is going to be something like the New Jerusalem in that everybody in the New Jerusalem has the Prince of Peace in their hearts. So we can model that here in this world. Churches ought to be places where we have peace in our relationships. Peace in our relationship with God, genuine peace, not the counterfeit. Peace in our, rela in our families. You know, well, that's a great New Year's resolution that we might resolve that our families can be a place of peace. Got to start with peace in our lives. That'll play out in peace in our families that will then be seen through peace in our church. Might I suggest a hypothesis that everything that happens to you during the day, God is giving you opportunities to trust Him. You will get rattled by the devil because the devil wants to rob your peace and God wants you to take him at his word when he said, uh, my peace I give unto you, to demonstrate peace. Can you choose to be peaceful? You can. You can choose to fret or you can choose to trust the promises of God and have peace and believe. Now, like I said, if you're outside of God's will and if you're living in, in uh, you know, known rebellion to some principle of God, then you ought to be troubled by that. When you fully surrender and you yoke up with Jesus, you ought to have peace. And when the devil comes to try and rob your peace, you remind yourself of the promises of God. If you have a lack of peace because maybe you've fallen and you've sinned, well, repent. Confess, believe. And then he restores that peace to you again because you take him at his promises that if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So if you're cleansed from all unrighteousness, you ought to have that peace again, that Holy Spirit that comes into our hearts. Amen? Amen. So even though you may not have physical peace, even though you might be tempted, does that mean that you don't have peace? Resisting temptation, you can keep your peace. Job 22 verse 21 now, when? Now. Acquaint yourself with Him and be at peace. When you know God and He's the Prince of Peace, then you have it. In um, Philippians 4 verse 9, the things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Uh, Isaiah 32 verse 17. I'm just giving you a lot of scriptures on peace right now. Hoping you're making some notes here as you can claim these. Jot them down. Isaiah 32 17. And the work of righteousness shall be peace. If the work of righteousness is, is peace, then the work of righteousness is a lack of peace. If you are righteous and you've got the righteousness of Christ, what is that work going to be in your life? Peace. God will calm your troubled soul. You know that story that we started with? And it's in the free offer that uh, we mentioned at the beginning of our, our study together. When Jesus calmed the troubled sea, he calmed a raging sea. And the disciples were still concerned. Then right after that experience, he lands on the shore and he encounters a man who is the most unpeaceful man you've ever met. He's going around dragging chains. He's raging. He's a lunatic. He's cutting himself with stones out of his mind, surrounded by pigs in cemetery, surrounded by dead bodies and, and hogs. I mean, talk about uh, an unpeaceful situation. Jesus then sets him free from the demons. He speaks peace into his life, and uh, he's transformed. Instead of raging after Jesus delivers him from his demons, 
He's then found sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to his teaching. He's clothed, and he's in his right mind. So Jesus calms a raging sea, he crosses the ocean, and he calms a raging soul. That man, that Jesus, that demoniac, he represents this world. Christ crossed the ocean of space and came to this world where we are surrounded by death, we are unclean, we are tormented, we are naked, you know the last five words in Genesis, in a coffin in Egypt. Starts in a garden with paradise, it ends in a coffin in Egypt. That's what sin did. Christ came to this cemetery of our world to calm a raging soul. And he does that for every one of us when we come. That demoniac could do nothing to save himself except he came to Jesus just like he was. Covered with scars. We've all got our scars. Covered with chains. But he came to Jesus like he was. And did Jesus set him free? Will he do that for us? Did he give him peace? That's the work of righteousness. The work of righteousness will be peace. Romans 2.10 but glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Can we expect peace if we're not living in God's will? Who does he promise that peace? But glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good. Now I'm not saying we're saved by our works, but it's, I'm just reading the Bible, friends. If you're doing the good work of uh, living in God's will, you'll have that peace. Isaiah 48 verse 18. Here's what God says. Oh, that you had heeded my commandments. Then your peace would have been like a river and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. Erwin Lutzer said, emotional peace and calm come after doing God's will and not before. Not before. When we surrender to the will of God, we have that peace like a river. And that's what the Lord wants to give each one of us. You want that, friends? Amen. Amen. This is one of the fruits of the Spirit that we're studying this quarter. And I want to say again to our friends who are watching, remind you that we do have that free offer. It's called Broken Chains. We'll send to anyone who asks. Ask for offer number 709, and we'll send it to you. God bless until we can study again together next Sabbath. Thank you. If you've missed any of our Amazing Facts programs, visit our website at AmazingFacts.org. There you'll find an archive of all our television and radio programs, including Amazing Facts Presents. One location, so many possibilities. AmazingFacts.org.